This is Chapter 20 of Wilkins, Dental Calculus. And Dental Calculus is a mineralized dental biofilm that's filled with crystals of various calcium phosphates. Think about what we've discussed in the past in other chapters with biofilm and its organic, inorganic components of various tooth structures, calcium and phosphate. Seems to be a recurring theme here. Um, but it's covered with a layer of non-mineralized dental biofilm containing viable active bacteria. So calculus, even though it's hard, always has biofilm attached to it. It's the hard, tenacious mass that forms on the clinical crowns of natural teeth and dental implants, dentures, and other dental prosthesis. So dental calculus can be formed anywhere. A major objective to non-surgical periodontal therapy is to prepare the teeth through calculus removal to have a biologically acceptable smooth surface. Our clinical care requires comprehensive understandings of the characteristics, origin, development, and methods of prevention of calculus that's essential for patient examination, assessment, treatment, and instruction. So for patient learning, um, we need successful treatment and prevention. The patient needs to know the interrelationship between biofilm, calculus, and oral health. They need to know the need for complete removal of calculus, as well as the reasons for the painstaking manner in which scaling procedures need to be carried out. For the classification and distribution of calculus, Dental calculus is classified by its location on the tooth surface as related to the adjacent free gingival margin. That is, is it super gingival or sub gingival calculus? So, super gingival calculus uh, is usually on the cervical third of the mandibular anteriors and can extend slightly sub gingival. Supergingival calculus on the second uh, picture, the first one is A, on the second picture it's supergingival calculus over the crown as well as the exposed root surface and the margin of the gingiva. Then you have subgingival calculus and that is underneath the gum tissue. Calculus along the root to the bottom of the periodontal pocket and the bottom of the periodontal pocket is marked off as this X. So supergingival calculus, the location of it is on the clinical crown, coronal to the margin of the gingiva. It can also be on implants and complete and partial dentures as well. For the distribution, the most frequent sites are going to be on the lingual surfaces of the mandibular anterior teeth and the facial or buccal surfaces of the maxillary first and second molars. Those are opposite of the openings of the ducts of the salivary glands. You've got your Stenson duct on the buccal mucosa and the sublingual caruncle on the floor of the mouth. So on the crowns of the teeth out of occlusion, could also get calculus, as well as on non-functioning teeth or teeth that are neglected during daily biofilm removal, be it not brushing or flossing or other personal care. Calculus can also form on surfaces of dentures, dental prosthesis, as well as tongue-piercing barbells. Those are fun to clean. So think about where the salivary glands are, where the ducts are. Those are the primary places for supergingival calculus, but they can really form anywhere. Other names for supergingival calculus, you might see supramarginal or extra gingival or coronal calculus, indicating that calculus is on the anatomic crown. There's also salivary calculus, and that's a term indicating that the source of the minerals is the saliva. The terms supergingival and subgingival are really the most commonly used terms, though. 
supramarginal, submarginal, or more specific in their definition because the margin of the free gingiva is the dividing line between the two categories. This is typically what you'll see with your patients in clinic. These are the mandibular anteriors. There's calculus that you can see, super gingival. It probably goes a little bit subgingival. But take a look at the color and contour and texture of the gingiva around that calculus. What I find students do is when they're doing a gingival description, they'll say light coral pink. And it's like, yes, some of the mouth might be light coral pink, knife-edged, stippled. But take a look at some of the redness that is going on here. You can see the red, bulbous capillas, rolled, loss of stippling. It's very glossy. These are signs of inflammation. Let's have a review question. Calculus occurs more, most frequently on the lingual surfaces of the maxillary molars, the facial surfaces of the maxillary molars, the lingual surfaces of the maxillary incisors, or none of the above. And it's the facial surfaces of the maxillary molars. Out of the choices that you are given. Okay, mandibular anterior teeth also, the lingual of the mandibular anterior teeth is also very common, especially on the curve of those anterior teeth. It's difficult for a lot of patients to adequately clean the biofilm off on a regular basis. Now let's talk a little bit about subgingival calculus. The location of it is on the clinical crown apical to the margin of the gingiva, extending nearly to the clinical attachment on the root surface. It can also form on dental implants. The distribution may be generalized or localized. It could be on a single tooth or a group of teeth. The heaviest deposits are related to areas most difficult for the patient to have access during personal oral biofilm removal procedures. If they can't get to the biofilm to disrupt it, it's going to stay there, pick up minerals, and form into calculus. Other names for subgingival calculus could be submarginal, ceramul, ther I can't even say the word, ceramule, the term indicated, indicating that the source of the minerals is from the blood serum versus the salivary calculus for supergingival. Composition. Calculus is made up of inorganic and organic components as well as water. The percentages vary depending on the age and hardness of the deposit as well as the location from which the sample was taken. So mature calculus usually contains between 70 to 90% inorganic components. The rest is organic components in water. The chemical content of supergingival calculus and subgingival calculus is pretty similar. So the major inorganic components, okay, the main components are calcium, phosphorus, carbonate, sodium, magnesium, and potassium. There are some trace elements, various trace elements, um, can include chlorine, zinc, strontium, bromide, copper, magnesium, tungsten, gold, aluminum, silicon, iron, as well as fluorine. There is fluoride in calculus, and the concentration of fluoride in calculus varies and is influenced by the amount of fluoride received from fluoride in the drinking water and topical applications, um, denifrices, and any other form that are uh, received with fluoride by contact with external, the external surface of the calculus. At least two-thirds of the inorganic matter of calculus is crystalline, principally apatite. 
predominating is the hydroxyapatite, which is the same crystal present in enamel, dentin, cementum, and bone. Calculus also contains varying amounts of brushite with lockite and octocalcium phosphate. Calculus, when compared to teeth and bone, we've got the dental enamel that is the most highly mineralized tissue in the body and contains 96% inorganic salt. Dentin contains 65% and cementum and bone contain 45 to 50 percent. Mature calculus has approximately 70 to 90 percent inorganic con content. It's pretty hard stuff. A comparison of calculus with tooth parts provides insight into the effects of instrumentation and, and as well as the difficulty in distinguishing calculus from cementum or dentin when scaling subgingibly as well as the modes of attachment of calculus to the tooth surface. The organic proportion of calculus consists of various types of non-vital microorganisms, desquamated epithelial cells, leukocytes, and mucin from the saliva. Substances identified in the inorganic matrix include cholesterol, cholesterol esters, phospholipids and fatty acids in the lipid fraction, reducing sugars and carbohydrate protein complexes in the carbohydrate fraction, and keratins, nucleoproteins, and amino acids, which are all part of the protein portion. For calculus formation, Calculus results from the deposition of minerals into a biofilm organic matrix. So you have to have biofilm first. Calculus formation occurs in three basic steps. You have your pellicle formation, which we've discussed, your biofilm formation, which we've discussed, and then finally mineralization. Mineralization of supergingival and subgingival calculus is essentially the same, although the source of the elements for mineralization is not the same. So we've got the pellicle formation, and the pellicle or cuticle is composed of salivary mucoproteins from the saliva and is an acellular material. The pellicle begins to form within minutes after all deposits have been removed from the tooth surface. Then you have biofilm maturation. Microorganisms settle in the pellicle layer. Colonies are formed, and in early calculus, the colonies consist primarily of cocci and rod-shaped organisms, just like with the healthy biofilm. By the fifth, by the fifth day, excuse me, the biofilm is mostly made up of filamentous microorganisms. So the colonies grow together to form a cohesive biofilm layer. And we had a whole chapter on biofilm. Then finally, there's mineralization, okay, and we're going to be getting into that next. Mineralization foci or centers form undisturbed, okay, within 24 to 72 hours. More and more mineralization centers develop close to the underlying tooth surface. Eventually, those centers grow large enough to touch each other and unite. So they're building communities. Mineralization first occurs within the intermicrobial matrix. The filamentous microorganisms provide the matrix for the deposition of minerals. As the deposit ages, mineralization within the bodies of the bacteria occurs. Now, different studies were done, and one was called a germ-free animal study. And that's when a calculus-like deposit was, uh, has been observed on the teeth of germ-free animals that have no biofilm. It may indicate that other organic substances, such as the pellicle, may mineralize. But the pellicle is between the dental biofilm and the tooth surface. Since the attachment of calculus is very strong, it's expected that the pellicle must mineralize first to create that firm bond. So even in germ-free situations, calculus can form. 
some of the sources of minerals for supergingival calculus. The source of the element is generally the saliva. For subgingival calculus, you have the gingival cravicular fluid and the inflammatory exudate uh, that supply the minerals for the subgingival deposit. Because the amount of sulcular fluid and exudate increases with inflammation, more minerals then are available for mineralization for the subgingival biofilm. So the mineralization consists of crystal formation, namely hydroxyapatite, octocalcium phosphate, whittleite, brushite, and each with a special characteristic development crystal pattern. The crystals form in the intercellular matrix and on the tooth surface of bacteria, and then finally within the bacteria. The mineralization process is considered the same for both supergingival and subgingival calculus. Heavy calculus formers, though, have higher salivary levels of calcium and phosphorus than do the light calculus formers. Light calculus formers have higher levels of carotid pyrophosphate. And it's the pyrophosphate that is an inhibitor of calcification and is also used in anti-calculus denifrices or the tartar control toothpaste. The pyrophosphate that is the tartar control substance in the toothpaste. So your mouth might have pyrophosphates in it if you're a low calculus former. The process in which the minerals, mainly calcium and phosphate, become incorporated from the saliva or the gingival sulcular fluid into biofilm matrix is still not completely understood. The research studies point to the probability that calcification of the calculus may involve the same phenomena as those of other ectopic calcifications, like your urinary stones, um, kidney stones, those type of things, and may be similar to normal calcification of bone, cartilage, enamel, and dentin. So we've got different types of calculus here. We have root calculus. This used to be subgingival calculus, and you can see the color of it. The older calculus is going to be darker in color than the newer calculus. New calculus is going to be nice and tooth colored. But as the calculus ages, hemoglobins and other substances leach from the um, cravicular area and get incorporated into the um, calculus itself. So old calculus, as we said in the biofilm lecture, can look like black pieces of pepper that you're scaling out. But if calculus is this prominent on the radiograph, there's a lot more in there that we can't see. Remember, calculus is calcium and phosphates, just like enamel and tooth structures. So if the radiation isn't penetrating the calculus, just like it isn't penetrating certain areas of the tooth structure, it is pretty dense stuff. So how early can mineralization of supra and subgingival calculus begin? Do you remember? 24 to 48 hours. Doesn't take long. So let's talk a little bit about the structure of calculus. Calculus forms in layers that are more or less parallel with the tooth surface. The layers are separated by a line that appears to be a pellicle that was deposited over the previously formed calculus. And as mineralization progresses, the pellicle then becomes embedded. So the lines between the layers of calculus can be called incremental lines. They form around the tooth in subgingival, or I'm sorry, supergingival calculus, but they also form irregularly from the crown to the apex of the root surface in subgingival calculus. And the lines are evidence that the calculus grows or increases by apposition of new layers. Think about chopping a tree down and you see the tree trunk and those layers. You've got your 
pellicle, then a layer of bacteria, which then calcifies. Pellicle on top of that, a new layer of bacteria that calcifies, and so on. So the surface of calculus um, is rough, and it can be detected by the use of an explorer or a probe. The outer layer of subgingival calculus is partially calcified. On the surface, um, it's thick, matte-like. There's a soft layer of dental biofilm. The outer layer of the biofilm on the subgingival calculus is in contact with the diseased pocket epithelium. And that's where those ulcerations start and those leakages of the hemoglobin to then start that calculus from turning uh, from the creamy white substance to a darker substance. So calculus is hard, it's porous, but there's always biofilm on top of it. Formation time means the average number of days required for the primary soft deposit to change into mature mineralized calculus. The average time is about 12 days. And within a range of 10 days for rapid calculus formers and 20 days for slow calculus formers. So there is a range. Mineralization can begin as early as 24 to 48 hours when a patient's personal daily oral hygiene is neglected. So formation time depends on the individual's tendency, but it is strongly influenced by the roughness of the tooth surface and the care and character of the personal biofilm control measures. So estimation of the approximate formation time for an individual can be helpful when trying to plan instruction and counseling, as well as to treatment plan for professional care and the frequency of maintenance appointments. One person might need to be coming in every eight weeks if they're a heavy calculus former versus a light calculus former might need to be coming in six to nine months. Calculus is more readily removed from um, some tooth surfaces um, more so than others. The ease or difficulty of removal can be related to the manner of the attachment of the calculus of the tooth surface. So several modes of attachment have been observed um, histologically as well as by electron microscopy. On any one tooth surface and in any one area, more than one mode of attachment may be found. So when studying the attachment types, the character of the hard, smooth enamel surface and that of the rough, porous cementum surfaces need to be compared. So there are three general modes of attachment that can be identified. We have um, attachment by means of an acquired pellicle. So as you know, the pellicle is a thin, acellular, homogeneous layer positioned between the calculus and the tooth surface. Calculus attachment is superficial because there's no interlocking or penetration occurring. Pellicle attachment occurs most frequently on enamel and on newly scaled or planed root surfaces. Calculus can be removed fairly readily because of the smooth attachment. Then you have, okay, then you've got these um, attachment to minute irregularities in the tooth surface by a mechanical locking into undercut. So enamel irregularities may include cracks, lumini, and curious defects. Cemental irregularities. Uh, include tiny spaces left at previous locations of the Sharpie's fibers, some resorption lacunae, scaling grooves and gouges, as well as cemental tears. It's difficult to be certain that all calculus is removed when it is attached by this method because calculus becomes locked into those irregularities. And finally, you have attachment by direct contact between the calcified intercellular matrix of the tooth surface. So interlocking of inorganic crystals of the tooth with the mineralizing dental biofilm occur. Distinction between the calculus and cementum is difficult um, during root debridement. Remember, you're usually working 
in a space that you don't have any visual context with as well. So calculus has long been considered to have an important role in the development, promotion, and recurrence of gingival and periodontal infections. Calculus is significant in the progression of inflammatory periodontal diseases. The disease-producing bacteria that's held on the rough surface of the calculus actually perpetuate the inflamed state supergingively for gingivitis and subgingively close to the pocket lining of the epithelium to promote periodontitis. The control of biofilm deposits by the patient supplemented by complete professional calculus removal by you, the dental hygienist, can reduce or eliminate gingival inflammation. Subgingival biofilm develops as a result of downgrowth of the supergingival biofilm bacteria. Remember how we said what occurs on top of the gum line has a direct effect on what goes on underneath the gum line. So subgingival biofilm contains pathogenic bacteria that cause inflammation and destruction in the soft tissues and can lead to loss of attachment in the tooth surface and the development and deepening of the pocket. With increased pocket depth, you have greater amounts of biofilm that can accumulate with decrease, I'm sorry, increased number of the pathogenic microorganisms. Think about the bacteria that's involved. Supergingively, you've got your aerobic gram positive versus subgingively, you've got your anaerobic gram negative bacteria proliferating. So irritation to the pocket lining actually stimulates greater flow of that gingival curricular fluid, which contains minerals for subgingival calculus formation. Calculus is mineralized biofilm. So the biofilm bacteria next to the tooth surface is that part that's mineralized first. Subgingival calculus is always covered by masses of active biofilm bacteria. I'm going to repeat that. Subgingival calculus is always covered by masses of active biofilm bacteria. The bacterial mass in contact with the disease pocket epithelium then promotes gingivitis and periodontitis. So with its rough surface, its permeable structure, and the porosity, calculus can act as a reservoir for endotoxins and tissue breakdown products. Calculus is a predisposing factor in pocket formation in that it provides a haven for the collection of bacterial masses on the rough surface of the calculus deposit. It does not cause periodontal disease. It's the bacteria that's on the calculus that does. So identification of calculus prior to removal depends on the knowledge of its appearance, consistency, and distribution. And you're going to be making those um, qualifications and descriptions before you start scaling. So appointment planning, selection of instruments and techniques depend on an understanding of the texture, the morphology, and mode of attachment of the calculus, as well as your um, ability to use your instruments effectively and your knowledge of oral anatomy. So for supergingival calcula uh, calculus examination, you've got your direct examination. You can see it. It's above the gum line area. You might need a mouth mirror if you can't see it directly. You can use compressed air. Small amounts of calculus may be invisible when they're wet, but the more air you use and light to dry, small deposits can easily be seen. So we've got our visual examination. Sometimes there's a dark edge of calculus that can be seen just at or below the gingival margin. And when you blow air gently, you can deflect that gingival margin from the tooth, and you can actually see into the pocket. You can use transillumination. Sometimes a dark, opaque, shadow-like area can be seen on the proximal surface of, tooth, uh, of the tooth surface um, that is subgingival. Without calculus, 
stain or thick soft deposit, the enamel normally is translucent, and that's something that you use transillumination for for super gingival calculus as well. You want to look at the gingival tissue color. Dark calculus may reflect through the thin margin of the gingiva, and you can actually see through the gingiva to see that dark calculus. You have tactile examination. Your first evidence of calculus might be when you're doing your periodontal assessment when probing. Sometimes you have to deflect the tip of the probe away from the tooth to get over the calculus ledge to get below it. Then there's your explorers, and that, of course, is a fine uh, subgingival explorer, your ODU 1112 that's needed um, that can be adapted to the tooth surface. Each subgingival area needs to be examined carefully to the bottom of the pocket so you can ensure complete removal of the calculus. And we have the radiographic examination. Now, radiographic examination alone isn't useful for calculus detection because of the highly mineralized tooth surface superimposed over the calculus deposit. But thick, highly mineralized calculus may be detected on proximal surfaces, um, except when there uh, is no overlapping of the radiograph. So not all calculus shows up on the radiograph because of the mineralization process and the degree of mineralization, as well as um, you can't see all around the tooth. It is not a 3D picture. Then we have the perioscope. And the use of an endoscope in deep pockets and for patients is really wonderful because it can show otherwise undetectable calculus, especially burnished calculus. So it's a little probe-like um, camera that goes between the gum and the tooth, and you can actually look inside the pocket. What's interesting is when you use the endoscope on an area of non-responsive, after you, you do a periodontal debridement on a non-responsive area, it's generally because calculus is left. You can't always feel it. You can't always get it. But when you have an endoscope and you can actually see where that calculus is and you, and you can scale that off, you know for sure that it's removed. It's amazing what the studies are showing, the befores and afters, by using an endoscope and doing a thorough scaling. So dental calculus can be a serious periodontal health problem without the patient suffering any pain or discomfort. They don't know they have periodontal disease. Patients at risk for calculus formation really need personalized counseling. Risk factors related to calculus formation are similar to those with um, prudential biofilm formation and relate to biofilm removal during the patient's personal daily oral care. There are several methods for coping with the problem of calculus, including patient instruction in daily care and professional clinical non-surgical periodontal therapy. So the whole crux is personal dental biofilm control. The objective is the removal of dental biofilm by appropriately selecting brushing, flossing, or supplementary methods as a major factor in the control of dental calculus formation. You need to individualize your instruction. The patient needs to understand the necessity for individual daily biofilm removal, and they need to be motivated to spend time each day doing this. So the dental hygienist, you, first need to teach the patient and demonstrate the best choices of the equipment and instruments that they need and to correct procedures for the patient's individual mouth. Then, patiently, you need to follow up at each continuing appointment to try and find something to commend the patient on their successes and to reteach as necessary. Always try and find something positive. And of course, regular professional supervision. That's where you come in. Professional maintenance appointments on a regular basis can supplement 
the personal care that the patient is doing. There are always areas that the patient just can't get access to. Remember all those concavities we're talking about in oral anatomy. Brushing and flossing doesn't get everywhere. So that leads us to us, the professional removal of calculus. So thorough removal of calculus provides a smooth tooth surface in an environment that's more conducive to gingival healing. Smooth surfaces can be kept cleaner easier by the patient. So with emphasis of good oral hygiene and routine professional removal, low levels of supergingival and subgingival calculus have been demonstrated on a long-term basis. So it really is important to be bringing the patient back frequently enough for their individual needs so you can help them stay on top of the calculus formation. There are anti-calculus or tartar control denifrices and mouth rinses. Now, of course, we don't use the word tartar, do we? We use the word calculus. So instead of tartar control, the real term is anti-calculus. The calculus control denifrices currently available aim to inhibit calculus crystal growth, which in turn should lessen the amount of calculus deposited on the teeth. So the denifrices or toothpaste do not have an effect on existing calculus deposits and are offered as a preventive measure against the formation of new supergingival calculus. For a patient who cannot control supergingival calculus and then um, can't achieve optimal gingival health, an anti-calculus denifrous may provide motivation as well as a supplement to the mechanical biofilm removal. The agents in the quote-unquote tartar control mouth rinses and denifrices are those pyrophosphates, those low calculus formers, remember, have pyrophosphates in their saliva. But there's also zinc citrate or zinc chloride as well as triclosan. Triclosan is the Colgate product, the Colgate total. Soft tissue irritation and dentinal hypersensitivity have um, been noted with patients using certain of the um, anti-calculus ingredients. So let's take a look at Kathy. Kathy's in for a recare appointment, and she recently purchased some tartar control toothpaste, and it seems to be working for her. She asks, how does it prevent tartar from forming? So what do you say? We tell her it contains pyrophosphate, okay, that the saliva is self-cleansing and um, can help prevent biofilm accumulation. The pyrophosphate is an inhibitor of the calcification process, which is the tartar control. Agents, again, in the tartar control or anti-calculus mouth rinses and denifrices are not only the pyrophosphates, but as well as zinc citrite citrate, excuse me, zinc chloride and triclosan. Again, these tartar control formulas are only good on new calculus formation above the gum line area. Tartar control formula will do nothing for this patient at this time. And yes, we have patients that look like this in the clinic. Personally, I can't wait to get my hands on them. Very typical of what you see. Look at the gingiva around all of that. So, we really are in a great position to teach our patients good oral hygiene and frequent professional care for complete scaling are consistent with low levels of calculus. We need to teach our patients what calculus is and how it forms and how the biofilm, dental biofilm, has to be there first. 
the effects of calculus on health of the periodontal tissues and therefore on the general health of the oral cavity. Biofilm control measures um, patients need to be aware of. We spend a lot of time educating our patients. They need to know what to expect um, from the use of anti-calculus products, that it is not the, um, the magic bullet that the commercials are making it seem and encourage our patients to select ADA seal of acceptance um, products. And that's it for chapter 20 on dental calculus.